This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Reaching back into my audiobook archives today, two chapters from my book, Trend Commandments, back-to-back chapters from that book. First, an interesting observation by myself about the trend-following trader David Harding on his appearances on CNBC. These appearances were some time ago, but what transpired is timeless. The second chapter included today a white paper, an origins white paper of trend following, written by the turtle trader Stig Osgard, who graciously allowed me to include it in my book, Trend Commandments. Without any further delay, let's jump right in and give you a little of that summertime trend following education. Because you know, funny stuff often happens in the fall. Get ready, strap it on, time for something new, get the trend-following philosophy, get the trend-following strategy, and let go of all the bullshit. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Earlier in the chapter, Systematic Trend Following, I included a small excerpt from CNBC's Aaron Burnett interviewing trend-following trader David Harding a few years back. On April 8, 2011, CNBC anchor Joe Kernan interviewed Harding as well. At the time of that interview, Harding's firm, Winton Capital, was managing $21 billion in assets for clients via trend-following strategies. Now that you have read Trend Commandments, consider Kernan's interview and my questions that follow. Kernan started the interview reading from a piece of paper that described Harding as a systematic trend follower who believes scientific research will succeed in the long run. He wondered out loud if computers were used and asked Harding to describe his trading strategy. Harding, on remote from London, responded that his firm goes with the flow. He follows trends and makes money going long on rising markets and short on declining markets. He mentioned that there had been enough trends for his firm to make money nearly every year for the last 15 years. Kernan pounced, wondering whether he could blame Harding and other trend followers for oil and gold going higher and for the pendulum swinging much further than it should on a fundamental basis. Harding thought there might be some truth to Kernan's point, but there was only so much time to elaborate. Kernan, under his breath, with a huge, wide smile emerging, interjected at that acknowledgement, Um, yeah. Harding reminded Kernan that his firm was limited by speculative position limits set by the government, and that his trading size was tiny by comparison to major investment banks. Harding went on to further clarify that he doesn't trade by a gut feel. He added, We don't just make it up. He also didn't apologize for his scientific approach to markets, an approach he defined as rigorous. Kernan replied with a shot across the bow, bringing up failed hedge fund long-term capital management, LTCM. He saw it as ironic that LTCM folded in the same year, 1997, that Harding's firm launched. I heard science, and I heard you've never had a down year, and it reminded me of LTCM. Kernan talked sarcastically about the Nobel Prize winners at LTCM, their algorithms, and the fact that they never had a down year until their blow-up. Harding quickly clarified that his firm did have a down year in 2009, and that his performance success actually went back over two decades, 23 years to be exact. He noted that his first firm, AHL, which he sold, was now the world's largest managed futures fund. He also addressed LTCM head-on, stating that the book, When Genius Failed, the story of LTCM blowing up, was required reading at his firm. Kernan, with condescension, quipped, I bet it is. 
He then went on to ask Harding if he could provide some of his best picks. That question makes perfect sense for every fundamental trader who thinks he can predict the future, but it is a ridiculous question to ask a trend-following trader. Harding replied that he could not forecast markets. I can't give you best picks. He pointed out that his success comes from having a slight edge and proper betting. Kernan, still not about to acknowledge anything positive about trend following, smugly asked if Harding would know when the party was over. Harding was nonplussed, noting that there had been a long history of successful trend following going back 40 years. He also compared 2010 to 2011's great trending markets to another era, the 1970s. Kernan, with little journalistic objectivity, shot back that he had heard those kinds of expressions before. Please let there be another real estate boom because I spent all the money I made. I heard commodities guys saying that for a while too. He then wrapped up with standard pleasantries and one last zinger, hoping that Harding could come back again with the same moniker and same title. Before analyzing the interview, consider a definition of critical thinking. Critical thinking is the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and or evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation, experience, reflection, reasoning, or communication as a guide to belief and action. In its exemplary form, it is based on universal intellectual values that transcend subject matter divisions, clarity, accuracy, precision, consistency, relevance, sound evidence, good reasons, depth, breadth, and fairness. With that in mind, here are some questions to ponder. 1. Is it believable that Joe Kernan, the anchor of CNBC's longest-running program, had no knowledge and or comprehension of trend following, or other descriptions of it such as managed futures or CTAs, if he was forced to raise his right hand under the threat of perjury, do you think he would still have such a limited understanding of trend following and managed futures? 2. When Kernan asked about trend followers purportedly pushing markets further than they should be fundamentally, did that mean he had a way to determine the correct price level of all markets at all times? 3. When Kernan brought up long-term capital management, in attempt to compare Harding to its demise, did he not understand that Harding did not believe in efficient markets? Had he ever looked at a monthly up-and-down track record of Harding or any trend follower? 4. Why ask a trend-following trader for picks? 5. When Kernan asked Harding if he would come back with the same moniker and title, was he implying that he believed Harding would blow up soon and be back on CNBC under some reformulated firm name, like what the proprietors of long-term capital management did after their blow-up? Has he ever asked Warren Buffett that question? I can easily see some painting this interview differently. Harding set himself up for the LTCM tie-in by framing himself as a computer science shop looking at data and being black box. You have to expect Kernan to kick you. That's what he does just like you know what you're going to get from Glenn Beck or Stephen Colbert. Harding basically says, we're the smartest guys on the planet, trends work, and we look at a lot of data. One reader, a reader who runs a fundamental advisory service, wrote me, whether Kernan's questions were clueless or not is really irrelevant. He did not argue with Harding on any point, and he gave Harding a good opportunity, within the time available, to explain how his firm implements trend following. Kernan was an adult in the room. I'm thinking that's the way serious trend followers ought to consider presenting themselves instead of sarcasm and we don't predict, as if that is an obvious answer to any question. The evidence does not bear those criticisms out. There is a deeper game at play beyond my questions. Joe Kernan is not devoid of academic intelligence. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology and master's degrees from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He worked at several investment banks, including Merrill Lynch. I am no Harding fanboy or apologist, but I have spent time with him. 
That research time, coupled with his public career and track record, make him one of the most learned trend-trading voices of the past 20 years. It is clear to me that Kernan had a pre-formulated agenda. His questioning was a transparent attempt to marginalize Harding and trend-following. Why would Kernan do that? Imagine if the interview started like this. We at CNBC believe in efficient markets and the use of fundamental analysis. Our business model requires viewers to watch. Today, we have a guest on who has made billions with trend-following trading, which does not require fundamental analysis or CNBC. Would you like to know how to make money without ever watching our channel again? Welcome, David Harding. A Kernan ego will never debate this subject on neutral grounds, but that is no surprise. Learn from this interview and the analysis. For those with their eyes wide open, this is yet another money-making confidence builder. Origins Stieg Ostgard is a turtle trader, a trader covered in my second book, The Complete Turtle Trader. He graciously allowed his history of trend following to be reprinted in Trend Commandments. Although trend following has been a popular trading philosophy for many years, surprisingly little has been written about its origins and history. This is partly due, no doubt, to the scarcity of available information prior to the early 20th century, and because until about 50 years ago, trend following as a philosophy had not been completely articulated. To be sure, by the early 1950s, many trend following methodologies were in common use, and may have been for centuries but the underlying concept had not been fully defined or even given a name. One reason for this paucity of early information is suggested by the following part of the term trend following. The implication is one of passivity, of reaction, rather than of bold, assertive action, and human nature shows a distinct preference for the latter. Also, trend following appears to be too simple of an idea to be taken seriously. Indeed, Simple ideas can take a long time to be accepted. Think of the concept of a negative number, or of zero. Simple to us, but problematic to ancestors. But, for whatever reasons, people learn easily from the past only that which the participants of the time choose to reveal, and above that, what their chroniclers found interesting enough about which to write. People know the stories of the plungers, the manipulators, and their corners, of Daniel Drew, Jay Gould, James A. Patton, and Arthur Cutton, but little of the lesser-known traders or followers sitting on the sidelines analyzing the markets, perhaps more successfully than their legendary contemporaries. Nevertheless, history is not completely in the dark. There are things to be revealed by looking back into history. Let's deconstruct the subject. Is trend following one thing, or is it many? Certainly it has, at least today, many manifestations. There are breakout systems, moving average systems, volatility systems, and many others, all of which can be considered to be trend following in nature. But these are the particulars. What are the universals? What is trend following's basic nature? As a first attempt at definition, I would suggest that trend following has two natures. It is at one level a phenomenon of the human psyche, an expression of the Keynesian animal spirits that percolate from the deepest levels of man's being. This type of trend following is spontaneous, inductive, adaptive, and evolutionary, a burst of conformity to innovations in the immediate environment. At this level, the masses have always been trend followers, not only in financial matters, but also in terms of music, art, clothing, and basic worldviews. But the other level of trend following is something else entirely. This is the meta-level, which sits above the tableau of material and psychological cause and effect, allowing participants to observe the behavior of the markets as a whole, and to design intelligent, premeditated responses to market action. This is the level of trend following from which we as traders should and usually do operate. Now, although trend following at this meta level can certainly become complex, still its essential elements can be simply stated. They are three. One, to initiate positions based on the perceived direction of the trend. Two, 
to hold positions based on the perceived direction of the trend, and 3. to liquidate positions based on the perceived direction of the trend. There is also possibly a fourth thing, as suggested above. It is to do all of these things systematically on the basis of logical relationships or mathematical formulations. But I do not think that this is an absolute requirement. It is certainly possible to be a subjective trend follower or to combine systematic and subjective elements in a trend-following system. In fact, I believe that some great traders did indeed include subjective elements in their methodologies. Here, however, I will focus on the systematic aspect. And here again, the systematic nature of trend-following can be simply stated. Generally, though not invariably, trend-following systems look for their implementation only at the movement of prices, the basic perception is that if a market's price is going to make an exceptional move in one direction or another, it will first make a moderate move in that direction, leading to the conclusion that if an initiation can be made at that moderate level, the remaining portion of the trend can be followed for a significant period of time thereafter and liquidated at a profit. This scenario is not always expected to be true, of course, but if it is true often enough and to a significant degree enough, then it may lead to profitable trading in the long run. As much as people can associate trend following with human nature, no one knows who the first trend followers were. If there is no known beginning, one is created. You can say something about a part of trend following, specifically of the three elements of trend following mentioned above, initiation, holding, and liquidation. It is the middle part, staying with a trend, that has had a reasonably long pedigree. A number of the speculators and plungers of the past, when asked about their trading strategies, said that they held on to their positions as long as possible, i.e., they stayed with the trend. As one example, consider the economist and trader David Ricardo, who flourished in the London markets from the 1790s until about 1818. A large trader in consoles, bonds, and stocks, he accumulated a large fortune from his speculations which afforded him the leisure to focus on his primary interest in life, economics. Exactly what his methodologies were is not known, but it is to him that one of the most famous sayings in all of trading history is attributed. Cut short your losses, let your profits run on. This is good advice, no doubt. It has survived to the present time and is expressed often. Still, there is no detail here, no advice on how to cut losses, or how to let profits run on. And while the first part of the maxim says something about some liquidations, nothing is said about initiations. The ending part, however, is a clear exposition of a central tenet of trend-following philosophy. As long as the trade is going your way, don't get out. For another example, move forward a century and west to another continent. Here is a quotation from the famous grain trader of the Chicago pits. Arthur W. Cutton. Most of my success has been due to my hanging on while my profits mounted. There is the big secret. Do with it what you will. Again, Cutton is saying, stay with the trend. For a third and final example, let us introduce Jesse Livermore, a very central figure in the history of trend following, about whom more will be said later. Here is a significant quote from him. The big money is not in the individual fluctuations, but in the main movements, that is, not in reading the tape, but in sizing up the entire market and its trend. This last quote is from Edwin Lefebvre's Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, a series of articles from the Saturday Evening Post in 1922-1923, reprinted in book form many times. Although the speaker is stated to be Larry Livingston, it is generally agreed, based on known biographical information, that Lefebvre's interviewee was Jesse Livermore. The quotation, in turn, is Livermore's interpretation of an oft-repeated statement made by Old Partridge, a brokerage house acquaintance of Livermore's, that, It's a bull market, you know. This advice was given whenever some trader was tempted to liquidate a winning position too soon and was not always well regarded. To Livermore, however, the advice finally sank in, yielding the analysis above and, it would seem, changing his trading style, if not permanently, 
at least in his periods of trading well. Old Partridge, alas, though people would like to know a lot more about him, will remain a mystery. How did he initiate his positions? How did he liquidate? No one will probably ever know. Prior to the mid-19th century, speculation seems to have been largely the province of the elite and a small coterie of early but still semi-elite trend followers. The larger public's participation was primarily as trend followers in the lower sense, taking part in one or another of the bubbles that permeated the financial scene from time to time, helping to precipitate the panics that occurred regularly during the period. But the next half-century and beyond saw the growth of a much larger pool of market participants, as well as some fundamental changes in thinking and procedures. According to William Fowler, in his book Ten Years in Wall Street, written in 1870, the key year was 1862, when began the greatest era of speculation the world has ever seen, while Uncle Sam's presses were printing greenbacks by the million. To be sure, some price movements in stocks and commodities during this era were breathtaking. In addition to the grain corners previously mentioned, there was the Gold Pool of 1869, as well as regular bull runs in numerous railroad stocks. The importance of Fowler to knowledge is that he was not just a writer, he was a participant. He knew the major traders of the day personally and participated in many of the market movements of the day himself. Finally, there is an extensive and meaningful narrative concerning speculation and the workings of the markets during a very formative period. Significantly, none of these writers records the use of any meaningful systematic trend-following methodology, although Fowler does give an example of Pat Hearn, who added to his position every time the price of his stock went up by 1%, and sold out entirely when it went down 1%. Henry Clues, in 28 Years, suggests a very primitive form of trend following, advising young traders to watch the behavior of the old retired operators who, away from the hustle and bustle, and after many, many years of experience, finally imbued with wisdom, leave their homes only a few times a year to make their appearances on the street, at times of market euphoria to sell and in panics to buy. I say to the young speculators, therefore, Watch the ominous visits to the street of these old men. If you only wait to see them purchase, you can hardly fail to realize handsome profits on your ventures. Good advice, perhaps. But the problem was actually greater. Rather than old men, it was the rings and pools that more often began major market moves. How could one tell when a pool had started buying, or had begun selling? These questions had no real fundamental answer, or at least none that was accessible to the average small trader in these markets. To be sure, there were newspapers, but how was one to know the truth of what was being reported? Even if there was no outright disinformation, surely the big speculators did not telegraph their intents so easily. They rather tried to hide their buying and selling. So, for the small trader, the question was a technical one to be answered by observing who was doing the buying and selling, to whatever extent that was possible, or by watching the price action of the stock itself and the volume. And so I would argue that the technical approach to trading, including trend following, came about not by design, but by necessity. Speculation in the 19th century was, it would appear, rich in practice but poor in theory. What was needed was an approach that could step back from the fray, observe the actions of the marketplace from an objective distance, and contemplate the nature of price fluctuations and swings over the period of days, months, and years. Were there meaningful patterns hiding in the ebb and flow of prices? Could knowledge of these patterns be the basis for trading the markets? Was there a theory that might provide structural, systematic underpinnings for a true trend-following model? In fact, such a model was being developed, if incompletely, as the century was drawing to a close. The model was called Dow Theory, based on the concepts originated by Charles H. Dow in a series of articles in the Wall Street Journal between 1899 and 1902, expanded upon by William Hamilton between 1903 and 1929, 
and refined by Robert Rea in 1932. Inasmuch as Dow theory defines a bull market as a series of higher highs and a bear market as a series of lower lows, the rudiments of a trend-following strategy become apparent. One buys on the breakout of an old high and sells on the breakout of an old low. Of course, there are further rules dealing with confirmation and volume, but as a bare-bones system, the above will suffice, recognizing, of course, that the methodology can be applied to individual equities and commodities as well as averages. The Dow theory is, I believe, the earliest modern expression of an objective trend-following system, inasmuch as it defines precisely, as long as one can define precisely, what constitutes a meaningful high or low, the entry and exit levels for trend-following trades. Further, the methodology can be generalized and parameterized. Different levels of breakouts can be used, moving averages of prices can be used, etc. Dow theory is certainly the grandfather of trend-following methodologies. Indeed, one can argue that subsequent methodologies are mere refinements of it. Dow theory itself is not very mathematical, Rather, it makes logical observations about current and past prices to determine the direction of the market. This innumeracy is not surprising, since the theory was developed long before the advent of the computer. Nor is it surprising that the earliest offshoots of Dow theory continued in this observational, structural mode of analysis. Robert Prechter, for example, states that R. N. Eliot developed his wave methodology through contemplation of Dow theory. Richard W. Schobecker, Robert D. Edwards, and John McGee also recognized Dow theory as seminal to their thinking, with Edwards and McGee's book, Technical Analysis of Stock Trends, for example, devoting three chapters to the subject. Indeed, Technical Analysis of Stock Trends, first printed in 1948, as well as its predecessors, Schobecker's Technical Analysis and Stock Market Profits from 1932, and Profits in the Stock Market, by Harold M. Gartley in 1935, are milestones in the development of trend-following methodology. Given the focus in these books on technical patterns, such as flags, pennants, triangles, head-and-shoulders patterns, etc., it may seem peculiar to associate these books with trend-following, but the point behind being able to distinguish such patterns is precisely to recognize signals for trend beginnings, continuations, and ends. To quote from Edwards, Profits are made by capitalizing on up or down trends, by following them until they are reversed. Aha! The terms trends and following, separated by only the space of a word, suggestive of an underlying trading philosophy supporting the myriad of details. The second book, by William D. Gann, titled Truth of the Stock Tape, first published in 1923, also emphasizes the trend. The way to make money is to determine the trend and then follow it. Indeed, the focus in this book and other works of Gann's that followed was, in one way or another, to take trades in the direction of the market's trend. Perhaps to the surprise of some, Truth of the Stock Tape is a very conventional work given Gann's later reputation for esotericism and astrology. The third book was Richard D. Wyckoff's Studies in Tape Reading, published in 1910. Significantly, Wyckoff uses the term follow the trend, albeit in a short-term day-trading context, when discussing one Jacob Field, prince of the floor traders. But he does not follow through with a philosophy or description. A few years later, however, Wyckoff was more decisively on the side of trend following, actually publishing a newsletter titled The Trend Letter. In a similar vein, in a later work, Wyckoff uses an interesting metaphor for trend following. A small trader should be a hitchhiker. But with respect to using charts as a means for profitably trading the markets, Wyckoff was skeptical. Let anyone who thinks he can make money following a figure chart or any other kind of chart have a friend prepare it keeping secret the name of the stock and the period covered. Then put down on paper a positive set of rules, which are to be strictly adhered to, so that there can be no guesswork. Each situation will then call for a certain play, and no deviation is to be allowed. 
cover up with a sheet of paper all but the beginning of the chart, gradually sliding the paper to the right as you progress. Record each order and execution, just as if actually trading. Put Rolo tape down as coppering every trade, and when done, send him a check for what you have lost. Of course, the methodology suggested by Wyckoff can now routinely be done on an iterative basis by computer. Not one, but millions of tests can be done with a rapidity that would have astonished Wyckoff. But would his judgment have changed? Possibly, since many years later, Wyckoff was using charts to draw trend lines, or as he called them, supply lines and demand lines, depending upon whether these lines connected high or low points. Let us get back to practice again and return to Jesse Livermore, who communicated much about his trading, either through Lefebvre's articles or through a book he wrote himself in 1940, How to Trade in Stocks. The early Livermore can be considered to have been at least partially a trend follower, inasmuch as he began his trading program in a small way at first, only adding to his line if the market went in his direction, and abandoning it otherwise, essentially the advice of Dixon Watts in 1891. He was also apparently a breakout trader, at one point describing a stock that was bouncing back and forth between two price levels, but observing that eventually either buying or selling would become stronger, and the price will break through the old barrier. This breakout, then, would define the line of least resistance. Later he says, Well, when the price line of least resistance is established, I follow it. Going forward to 1940, Livermore can more definitely be considered to have been a trend follower in that, in How to Trade in Stocks, he advocated the use of specific buy and sell signals based on his analysis of the perceived trend. At one point, Livermore uses the term following the trend directly. It may surprise many to know that in my method of trading, when I see by my records that an upward trend is in progress, I become a buyer as soon as a stock makes a new high on its movement, after having had a normal reaction. The same applies whenever I take the short side. Why? Because I am following the trend at the time. My records signal me to go ahead. Note that the verb follow has become the present participle following, an important conceptual necessity, though not the final one, I believe, in solidifying the idea of trend following as a continuing or recurring action. Central to Livermore's philosophy was the recording of pivotal points, or intermediate highs and lows. These pivotal points were in part the same thing as Dow theory intermediate highs and lows, or Edwards and McGee's basing points. Initiation and liquidation signals were based on significant movement away from these pivotal points, either three or six points, depending upon the type of rally or reaction that was being considered for a stock selling above $30. Thus, Livermore's formula was not a breakout system, nor a trend line system, but rather a type of filter rule, though a bit more complicated than the typically tested sort. The parameters used were arbitrary, but according to Livermore, based on much experience. Today, you can optimize parameters by computer to save time. Livermore's method certainly has some appeal, but one cannot help thinking that it might have been better understood and traded if it were chart-based. But Livermore was not a chartist. Personally, charts have never appealed to me. I think they are altogether too confusing. In addition to the work of Edwards, McGee, Livermore, and the others, the 1930s and 1940s saw several other advances relating to the theory and evidence for trend following. One of the more interesting studies came from the Cowles Commission for Economic Research, now the Cowles Foundation at Yale University, in 1937. Written by Alfred Cowles III, founder of the institution, and Herbert E. Jones, this study investigated the probabilities of sequences of rises and falls in stock market prices over several time horizons, ranging from 20 minutes to 7 months. Its conclusion was that, yes, there was a tendency for the market to continue in the same direction as the period before. In short, there was a serial correlation, at least from one period to the next, there was trendiness, and some justification for the use of trading methodologies that might today be called trend-following. In summary, the study states, 
This evidence of structure and stock prices suggests alluring possibilities in the way of forecasting. In fact, many professional speculators, including in particular exponents of the so-called Dow theory, widely publicized by popular financial journals, have adopted systems based in the main on the principle that it is advantageous to swim with the tide. Also worthy of note was a 1949 article in Fortune, Fashions in Forecasting, by Alfred Winslow Jones. Yes, that Alfred Winslow Jones, originator of the hedge fund concept and founder of the first hedge fund. In the article, Jones analyzes many of the then-current stock forecasting techniques, such as Mansfield-Mills buying and selling curves, Dow theory, and other methods having trend-following characteristics. His explanation of trend-following revolves around acceptance of the undoubted fact of momentum in psychological trends. The process he describes sounds something like George Soros's reflexivity. Thus, a movement in the stock price once underway generates unrealistic optimism or pessimism, so that the trend of prices then carries through and beyond some point of central value. After that, turned by profit takers or bargain hunters, with the basic forces of supply and demand altered, the market pendulum starts back and passes again through and beyond a point of reasonable value, wherever it may be. Therefore, the chances are worth considering that once a trend has reversed itself to some measured extent, as determined by the Dow theory, or the penetration of a moving average or trend line, the new trend will continue far enough to make it worth following. It is notable that Jones uses the exact terms trend followers and trend following in his article. But the meaning of the words perhaps differs from its usage today. For example, when he states that what Mills and Lowry have are still trend following tools with all their advantages and limitations, he seems to mean something more like trend lagging, such as when a moving average turns higher after a trend has already begun. In other words, trend following was not yet a fully formed concept. Trend was not yet a noun adjunct, nor following a gerund. The individual who finally made the connection was perhaps William Dunnigan, a trader, technical analyst, and writer who ran a business cycle forecasting company in Palo Alto, California in the 1950s. Dunnigan had many books and other publications to his credit, beginning with the academic Forecasting the Monthly Movement of Stock Prices in 1930 and following with a more technically oriented, mimeographed publication called Trading with the Trend in 1934, to name two. His major works, however, came out in the early and mid-1950s. Dunnigan is perhaps best known today for his thrust methodologies and one-way system. But his overall market perceptions were broad and deep. He had a knack for verbal innovation, including the invention of terms such as trap forecasting and continuous forecasting used to distinguish between those trades designed to capture quick profits, catching the market in a trap, and those with an indefinite duration, whose exit levels were determined on a day-to-day -day basis depending on market action. Starting with these perceptions, the transition to trend following is not an arduous one, for if a market is trapped into a directional commitment at the point of, say, a breakout, i.e. it generates a signal, then continuous forecasting takes over until the next trap, to liquidate or perhaps reverse, is signaled. But, if that is the model, then is the forecasting part of the formulation really necessary? Is not the process rather one of monitoring the market for the occurrence of the next trap, and then, when it occurs, acting upon it. Ultimately, in his 1954 work, New Blueprints for Gains in Stocks and Grains, that is what Dunnigan concluded, giving us some of the earliest articulated insights into the philosophy behind trend following. We think that forecasting should be thought of in the light of measuring the direction of today's trend, and then turning to the law of inertia, momentum, for assurance that probabilities favor the continuation of that trend for an unknown period of time into the future. This is trend following, and it does not require us to don the garment of the mystic and look into the crystal balls of the future. And again, 
Let us believe that it is possible to profit through economic changes by following today's trend, as it is revealed statistically day by day, week by week, or month by month. In doing this, we should entertain no preconceived notions as to whether business is going to boom or bust, or whether the Dow Jones Industrial Average is going to 500 or 50. We will merely chart our course and steer our ship in the direction of the prevailing wind. When the economic weather changes, we will change our course with it and will not try to forecast the future time or place at which the wind will change. William Dunnigan today remains an underrated trading researcher, although he was highly, if not widely, regarded in his day, even by academic economists. Elmer Clark Bratt, for example, refers to Dunnigan's Trading with the Trend in his Business Cycles and Forecasting, one of the premier economics textbooks of his day. Intermediate movements in the stock market do not last any stated length of time, so we never know just when a rally or a reaction will take place. What has been called trading with a trend by Dunnigan appears to be the only important forecasting principle which can be derived. Next in line among the pioneers of trend following was the much better known Richard Donchian, whose article Trend Following Methods in Commodity Price Analysis appeared in the Commodity Yearbook of 1957. Donchian's article was written in a confident, matter-of-fact manner, suggesting that he had a long, intimate knowledge of the principles about which he wrote, particularly the use of moving averages and swing trading, both developed in the article as examples of trend-following methodology. Like Dunnigan, Donchian discussed more than just the trading systems themselves. He also discussed the philosophy behind them. The comments he made about trend-following still hold true. Every good trend-following method should automatically limit the loss on any position, long or short, without limiting the gain. Whenever a trend, once established, reverses quickly, there is always a point, not far above or below the extreme reached prior to the reversal, at which evidence of a trend in the opposite direction is given. At that point, any position held in the direction of the original trend should be reversed, or at least closed out, at a limited loss. Profits are not limited because whenever a trend, once established, continues in a sustained fashion without giving any evidence of trend reversal, the trend-following principle requires that a market position be maintained as long as the trend continues. Richard Donchian, as most traders are aware, did much more than write about trend-following. He was also a broker, analyst, and trader, who most significantly was the founder of the first publicly managed futures fund, the Moving Average-Based Futures, Inc., in 1948. Starting in 1960, he began writing a weekly commodity trend timing letter, based on one of his better-known trend-following systems, the 520 Moving Average Method, thereby creating a documented decades-long performance record for his trading methodology. Further, Don Chin was an innovator in advancing an idea that is now the norm among large futures trading entities everywhere the concept of trading many markets at the same time in a portfolio. When I first got into commodities, no one was interested in a diversified approach. There were cocoa men, cotton men, grain men. They were worlds apart. I was also the first who decided to look at all commodities together. Nobody before had looked at the whole picture and had taken a diversified position with the idea of cutting losses short and going with a trend. And so with Dunnigan and Donchian, the story comes to an end. Although these two were by no means the first trend followers, nor surely the last, they were truly a watershed in the history of trend following. While many of the ideas that preceded theirs were trend following in nature, they were largely inchoate with an unstated or incomplete underlying philosophy. Dunnigan and Donchian, however, articulated this philosophy, indeed called it trend following, and thereby laid a foundation upon which later methodologies could comfortably rest. The narrative continues, of course, but since it has already been well and amply covered, I will stop at this point. Suffice it to say, however, that everyone remains under the influence of these pioneers of trend following, whether people know it or not. You can read an unabridged version of Stieg Ostgard's On the Nature and Origins of Trend Following at www trendfollowing.com slash 
resources. It's quite true what philosophy says, that life must be understood backwards. But one then forgets the other principle, that it must be lived forwards, a principle which, the more one thinks it through, precisely leads to the conclusion that life in time can never be properly understood, just because no moment can acquire the complete stillness needed to orient oneself backward. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.